Good morning or afternoon. I'm not quite sure which it is right now. I'd like to talk to you today about science fiction. Science fiction as a means of spreading ideas through storytelling. Science fiction as a form of speculative thinking, not just about what is, but also what is possible. And also science fiction as a way of engaging with and thinking about difference. And these are all important practices that we might think of as part of a larger social project for imagining and working toward better, more socially just worlds. The first thing I'd like to offer to you today is an example from a 1992 novel called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. In the story, Stevenson speculates about human history. He suggests that human civilization began with viral communication, a neuro-linguistic virus, he calls it, that affects the deep structures of the brain. And when he's talking about this kind of communication, this early kind of communication, he's making an effort to differentiate between the spread of information uncritically and the kind of higher level mental work that leads to creativity, critical thinking, and real learning. And this differentiation allows Stevenson to speculate about the limits and the possibilities of communi human communication and understanding. I'd like to read you a brief passage from the novel that illustrates how some of this fictional storytelling has some real world relevance. The passage begins as follows. We are all susceptible to the pull of viral ideas, like mass hysteria or a tune that gets into your head and you keep on humming all day until you spread it to someone else. Jokes, urban legends, crackpot religions, Marxism. <laughs> no matter how smart we get, there is always this deep irrational part that makes us potential hosts for self-replicating information. The only thing that keeps these things from taking over the world is the Babel factor, the walls of mutual incomprehension that compartmentalize the human race and stop the spread of viruses. I'd like to draw your attention to two key phrases here. Self-replicating information and mutual walls of incomprehension. By the first, self-replicating information, Stevenson is talking about ideas that circulate and are reproduced uncritically, unthinkingly, without being questioned. So we might think of this in terms of stereotypes or how to do things. I do it this way because my parents did it this way or because my peers do it this way without thinking about the effectiveness or the usefulness of how you're doing something. By walls of mutual incomprehension, Stevenson is referring here particularly to language difference, but language difference not as a limit to human communication and understanding, but as a barrier that spurs us on rather than holds us back, spurring on human creativity. So we may be, as Stevenson suggests here, susceptible to reproducing ideas, information, and assumptions without thinking about them critically, especially when we're immersed in social groups where people have experiences, values, and identities that are much like our own. But one of the key factors in challenging this kind of idea re reproduction is difference. Science fiction stories confront us with difference. They can allow us to reevaluate how we understand difference, how we see difference in ourselves, and question the self-replicating information that allows us to see our assumptions and our ways of viewing the world as correct and universal truths. So before I go on into some more examples to help explain what I mean, I want to touch briefly on what I mean by science fiction in particular. So what is science fiction? Well, science fiction is a genre. It's a type of story with recognizable traits, conventions, characteristics. You might be familiar with science fictional things like robots, aliens, 
space travel, time travel, utopian and dystopian futures, other worlds, and so on. One of the important things that science fiction does with these types of characters and themes and characteristics is to make the familiar strange to us. And the processes by which it does this, we refer to as estrangement, alienation, or defamiliarization. They, these processes can help us look at ourselves and our assumptions in a different light, possibly questioning the things that we take for granted. It often begins with us asking questions about the fictional world that we're reading about. How does this world work? How did it come to be this way? But it can extend to asking questions about our own world. How did we get to where we are? How might have things been different? And how might they be different, even better, in the future? So how does this apply to Snow Crash? That might help explain what I mean a little bit better. Well, the novel Snow Crash defamiliarizes human history and communication. It suggests that without difference, we wouldn't have been able to develop independent thinking, civilization and culture, human consciousness as we know it, and identity as we know it. And through this, difference in the story becomes something to value. Now, science fiction more generally deals with difference in a wide variety of ways, where in Snow Crash it's primarily this issue of language difference that's being emphasized, at least in the sections that I talked to you about. But difference is a common concern in science fiction, and particularly the social implications of difference and how we deal with others, individuals and groups who are not like us. Now, of course, thinking through these boundaries between self and other and the affinities between self and other, it's not unique to science fiction, but there are particular ways in which science fiction does this. In part, it's because science fiction can tell us stories about things like cyborgs and aliens, tell us about worlds in which they can actually exist, whereas they don't really exist to that extent in the world we live in right now. And science fiction can also offer us a way of working through what it means to be individuals and peoples separated by walls of mutual incomprehension, to again use Stevenson's phrase. Using difference to help us imagine and work toward more socially just futures. So to explain how this all connects, difference, science fiction conventions, imagining better futures, I'm going to talk about a few more examples. And two particular types of fiction. One is stories about different kinds of human and non-human beings. The second is stories about different kinds of societies and worlds. And these two types can show up in the same story. And in fact, I'm going to give you one example where that is the case but they represent two different ways of, of dealing with difference that have different functions. So the first type, stories featuring intelligent, featuring intelligent beings that are different from us, different from the humans we're used to seeing as normal or intelligent, or worthy, worthy of ethical interaction and respect. My first example in this category is a novel by Canadian author Peter Watts called Blind Sight. The novel, or the story, brings humans into contact with intelligent beings so alien that they make us question our own sense of intelligence. Reading the story also brings readers into contact with humans who are severely altered, are very far from what we understand as ordinary and normal. The cast of the story is a spaceship crew sent out to investigate a seemingly hostile alien craft. And Watts describes these characters very well on his website for the book. So again, I'm going to read you a short excerpt. It begins with a question. Who do you send to meet the alien when the alien doesn't want to meet? Well, you send a linguist with multiple personalities carved surgically into her brain. You send a biologist 
so radically interfaced with machinery that he sees x-rays and tastes ultrasound. You send an extinct hominid predator, once called vampire, that has been revived. And you send a synthesist, an informational topologist with half his mind gone, as an interface between here and there, as a conduit through which the dead center might come to understand the bleeding edge. Dead center and bleeding edge here might be understood to represent ordinary humans versus extreme difference, although everyone in the novel is extremely different. The crew includes humans who have been psychologically and physically modified, resulting in dramatic changes to their personalities, their perception, their capacity for human communication and understanding. And the alien that they meet has no sense of consciousness, no sense of self as we would know it. And through this alien character, Watts depicts the self and consciousness as evolutionary anomalies rather than something that make humans special. By telling a human story about altered aliens who come up against intelligent but nearly incomprehensible alien intelligence or alien life, blind sight can be read as a challenge to the idea that there is one universal definition of human and of intelligence. And this kind of challenge to our assumptions can give us a chance to recognize that beings, both human and non-human, don't have to be like us or have our type of intelligence to be worthy of respect and ethical interaction. And the second example in this category of stories about other beings is a novel from 1991 by American author Marge Piercy. Piercy focuses primarily on a character a highly advanced machine intelligence embodied in an android named Yod. Now what's important about this android it's, is its capacity for characteristics that we associate with the human. It has the potential for learning, for independent thought and action, for emotional connection. And through this character, the novel allows us to think through these concepts like intelligence, human, and person but also to think about the groups, the groups of people that we have historically excluded from these categories. Slaves, women, children, religious and ethnic minorities, indigenous groups. What both these novels do similarly is offer us representations of difference that don't easily fit into our existing worldviews. So these kinds of stories then can be seen as not vehicles for spreading self-replicating information, but for bringing us up against difference, where difference can become a barrier to that kind of self-replicating information, as well as a catalyst for developing new ways of thinking about the world and about ourselves. So onto that second type of science fiction that I mentioned, science fiction about multiple worlds that challenges us to think through our own societies and our own futures. I want to return to he, she, and it for a moment because this is one of those examples where both types show up in the same story. In this novel, Piercy contrasts different communities and societies that exist on the same planet. We have a future Earth where the dominant form of political and social organization is based on corporate capitalism. So we have people living in corporate enclaves that are ruled by corporations. But we also have free towns that practice more egalitarian forms of politics and are more open to expressions of difference, to flexible gender roles, for example. And we also have this interesting emergent community, a cooperative group of Israeli and Palestinian women they reproduce through cloning and, and genetic engineering, thus it can be a female-only community. But what's more important is that they live together in mutual respect and cooperation, respecting each other's religious beliefs, ethnic backgrounds, and so on. And what this representation gives us is a site of alternative ways for societies to develop other forms of social organization than what we live in, 
and a sense of hope that we are capable of accepting difference and working together in search of equality, not in spite of, but because of that diversity, the strength that that diversity brings to us. The next example, and my final example for today, is one that explores this idea of cooperation and the need for cooperation across difference a little further. It's actually a trilogy of novels, collectively known as the Neanderthal Parallax by Canadian author Robert Sawyer. And here we have worlds further removed from each other and from our reality, societies that are intelligent and civilized, but not necessarily human in the traditional or literal sense. So we have two worlds here, Earth more or less as we know it, and a parallel Earth. They branched off from each other around the time human consciousness and culture as we understand them started to take shape. The other Earth is one in which Homo sapiens died out and Neanderthals ended up being the dominant form of intelligent life on the planet. And they call themselves Barasts. And their society has advanced science and technology, advanced forms of social and political organization, but their form of modern life is very different from ours. They don't practice agriculture. Most individuals have partners of both sexes. Males and females live in equality, but segregated for most of the time. So this is a society that is much better than ours in some ways. They're much more ecologically minded than we are, for example, but it's worse than ours in other ways. So not a true utopia, but a contrast. Now what's important in terms of the plot is the way these worlds are brought into contact and communication and are forced together to solve a mutual threat. They're both threatened by magnetic field collapse of their planet, and it requires the knowledge of both planets to overcome this. So they have to work together despite their physiological, social, and cultural differences, and their mutual survival depends upon this cooperation, this diversity of knowledge. So moving toward a conclusion, why are these kinds of stories important to us? Well, they can ask us to think about the criteria we use to define a society as progressive, as rational, as modern. They can suggest that there are other ways of organizing human collectives that are effective, other ways of interacting with the non-human world, other forms of knowledge and practice that are valid and rational ways of knowing and engaging. And they can help us see that there are multiple possible ways that our societies, our world, might develop in the future. And we need this kind of openness to imagination, to possibility, to plurality, to get along together and survive on this planet, or any other for that matter. And we need a willingness to embrace a diversity of experiences, perspectives, and practices that different communities can bring to the table. We need these differences to build new knowledge, to make important decisions about how to move forward in co cooperation and solidarity toward better futures. So just a couple final thoughts why science fiction is important to this. Well, I would suggest that science fiction is a kind of self-questioning rather than self-replicating information, or can be. A way of telling and spreading stories about difference that often functions to challenge self-replicating information. There are different ideas circulating between different authors and audiences and communities. Science fiction isn't a homogeneous community. And these differences and the gaps between the people involved in making science fiction can work like the walls of mutual incomprehension that Stevenson talks about in Snow Crash. So they're not barriers to communication and understanding, but can be catalysts for human critical thinking and creativity and they can spur new readers and authors on to changing the genre, forcing the genre of science fiction to involve, evolve, imagining new ways of being and existing and interacting. And because science fiction is a popular genre, it's enjoyable, it's entertainment, these ideas and innovations can spread and circulate. 
not unquestioningly to simply reproduce information, but to encourage a kind of thinking, speculative, critical thinking, in the hopes that this kind of thinking can catch on. Thank you.